My name is Monica O'Brien and in this short video I'm going to be talking about um, prayers and religion and how these were used uh, to try and protect against uh, the great pox or syphilis in Germany between 1495 and about 1520. So once um, kind of starting with that foundational idea of God as the cause Many individuals in Germany and certainly beyond as well also view God as the greatest protection against uh, against this uh, unknown disease, um, especially in the late 15th and early 16th century when there was a lot of anxiety um, about um, kind of how are we going to treat this? How do we stay safe? How do we protect ourselves from from this disease? Um, because at this time, um, while we now think of syphilis as uh, predominantly a uh, sexually transmitted disease during uh, the late 15th and early 16th centuries, medical authorities and again the every person on the street believed that this disease could spread in multiple ways. Uh, so they, they believed, of course, it was, it was spread through sexual contact, but they also believed that it spread through things like um, non-sexual contact, so maybe a handshake, uh, through sharing a drinking vessel maybe with an infected person, through sharing cutlery, maybe even through exchanging money or touching a doorknob after an infected person. Um, so it was seen as a very contagious disease, one that you could catch if you were, um, not only if you were sinful and had, you personally had perhaps committed an offence against God, but it was also seen as something that did um, threaten and did indeed infect um, in contemporary thinking, um, people who were seen as innocent, people who hadn't blasphemed or committed any other form of sinfulness as well. Um, and in this context of the still kind of relative lack of knowledge about this disease, a lot of individuals were looking to God to, to protect them and to keep them safe. Um, and we see this particularly in, um, in prayers that were either published, uh, so on a printing press, or um, other people may have memorized them. Of course, we don't have written proof of that, at least not yet. Um, and certainly people were recording uh, prayers into to their notebooks, into manuscripts as well. Um, and these, um, these prayers so far, I've identified uh, seven, different, um, seven different copies. Some of them are quite similar. They're almost the same prayer with some variation, um, but seven different prayers essentially. Um, which um, were um, which come from Germany between 1495 and 1529. Um, so individuals may have been hanging these up in their house because some of them are printed on a single sheet. Uh, they may have learned them by heart and just repeated them to themselves, um, or they may have kind of carried them around in their pocket or so. Um, and a nice example of a, a collection of these prayers, um, it comes from the manuscript or the notebook of a weaver from the German city of Augsburg, a man named Simprecht Kroll. Um, this manuscript is now in the Universitätsbibliothek of Heidelberg. Um, and Kroll wrote down three different prayers that he picked up somewhere. We don't know if he maybe copied them directly from someone else, from maybe from a printed version, maybe heard them somewhere. Um, but he wrote down these three prayers um, which appeal to um, different saints and ask them to in turn ask God to, to please protect, to protect him um, and to protect presumably maybe his loved ones as well from um, from the great pox. Um, in particular, the different prayers address um, two different saints. Uh, so they address uh, Saint Minas, uh, also known as Saint Muin, or sometimes known as Saint Mean. Uh, Saint Mean is a sixth century Welsh abbot who migrated to Brittany. Um, after his death, his cult spread through France um, and it was invoked in the medieval period against something called Saint Mean's disease. Um, which some academics have argued is a form of dermatosis. Um, so if it is kind of a dermatosis, um, perhaps because it was seen as, St. Mean was seen as being a good saintly intercessor for um, a skin condition, is perhaps also why he, he appears in these prayers um, for the French pox as well, or the great pox, sorry, the French pox was, was another one of the diseases names 
um, in the um, in the late 15th and early 16th century. Um, another saint that uh, the prayers also speak to or appeal to is uh, the Irish saint, Saint Fiacre. He's a 7th century uh, ascetic who became a hermit in France uh, and eventually becomes the patron saint of, um, of persons who become infected with syphilis. Um, and both of the prayers kind of appeal to the saints and ask them um, and kind of ask them to ask God to, to forgive any sins and to please offer protection um, against, um, against the great pox so that the person who's praying them, carrying them, uh, doesn't become um, infected. Um, and this is just another example, um, this picture of a printed version of another prayer, uh, which was made to uh, the French Saint, uh, uh, Saint Denis, called Dionysus in this context. Um, and it's, um, they say, Dionysus, you have healed many people in France um, of the great pox, um, and also to kind of be friendly to, to the people of um, the empire and the German regions um, and also kind of extend your, your healing and your, uh, your care to, to us as well. So as well as being kind of the source of this disease, the protector uh, from this, uh, from the great pox, God was also believed uh, to play an essential role in, um, in curing the disease. Um, during uh, the late medieval and early modern period, um, many, uh, many people in society, medical men, clergy, the every person again, um, they believed that when God sent a disease, God also sent a cure, um, that God would always um, provide something on earth to, to combat it. Um, and by uh, the 1520s, um, Europeans believed they had perhaps discovered that cure in the form of the guacian plant, which grows um, in, in the Americas. Um, but as well as that, there was an important spiritual level, um, an important religious level um, to, to all forms of cure, because not all of them were using guacian. Uh, there were other various kind of herbal concoctions, and very infamously, mercury became extremely popular uh, for treating the great pox. Um, but religion was still seen as playing a fundamental role in this. Um, we see this, we see a very nice example of this in um, another German um, manuscript, uh, which is written perhaps in the late 15th century, um, probably around 1499. Um, this manuscript um, contains a story, uh, this manuscript I should say is also now, it's in the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, um, and it tells the story of a nobleman named Reinfrecht de la Flores, um, a man who has not led a particularly good life by the contemporary Christian standards. Um, the, he's described as being quite, um, quite a sinful, um, a sinful individual who becomes infected with the great pox. Um, tries all matter of like the best doctors, um, the best kind of medical care that money can buy, nothing helps him. And as he is on his deathbed, um, a religious man appears and kind of encourages him to, to pray, to repent, uh, to reflect on his, his life and see um, what were considered the error of his ways. Um, and he has a religious vision wherein uh, the Virgin Mary appears. Um, she, she heals him uh, on um, kind of on God's behalf and um, Kind of extols him to and um, tells him essentially that he must lead from now on a very good kind of Christian life that he must um, live uh, within that kind of Christian um, that Christian ideal of a very moral um, what they consider a very moral um, good person who obeyed um, all of the kind of the the laws of um, the laws of uh, the Christian God. Um, and and he does and uh, he's healed and he's better and the, the the story essentially concludes that he he does go off and he leads a very good life he's very charitable um kind good to his neighbors um very respectful of god and all of god's um rules in the christian um in the christian tradition um and this kind of idea of to be physically healed, you must first make peace with God is something we don't just see in religious texts um, or kind of popular belief, but also we do find it in, in medical works as well, where um, surgeons and physicians will encourage patients or even stipulate that patients must 
um, seek forgiveness if uh, if they've been sinful or um, perhaps um, if they've not been overly sinful they must still kind of ensure they put their faith in God and um, that they have a good relationship with God that everything is kind of I suppose neatly squared between them and God that they're living as God would want them to um, if they have done something sinful that's resulted in their infection or that's resulted in them being infected as punishment and um, then they should certainly reconcile of course it was believed that innocent individuals could contract the disease too and they are encouraged to to put all of their faith in god and even through kind of suffering to make sure that they that they always trust in god and um there's a lot of kind of i suppose optimism um from surgeons and physicians that if if a person can do this and have a healthy spirit then there's a strong chance that a healthy body will follow on from that that the physical cures the the guacium the mercury the herbs any other therapies that they're given will be maximally or they can perhaps only be effective if they make peace with god um and this was encouraged not only in medical texts but also um in practice um we see from amy melinda newhouse's uh, research uh, on Nuremberg that um, there was preaching in the municipal hospitals so again religion was actively brought into um, the city's hospitals the council made sure that there was religious provision um, for for those patients um, so that they could find the forgiveness or hope or whatever it was um, that they needed for their cures to be most effective um, and as well as this and um, this kind of extolling patients to to live a really good um, Christian life, be that as a Catholic or later after the Reformation in Nuremberg, it would have been as a Lutheran in other areas, um, eventually it would be other forms of Protestantism too. Um, but it was extolling um, individuals to live a good life in, in line with um, kind of the laws of these, uh, these religious traditions. Um, and these traditions aligned very closely with what would make ideal citizens for uh, for the cities as well uh, so it would um, obviously it went against against ideas of kind of committing crime and um, even you know people shouldn't be blaspheming or swearing in the streets so an ideal um, Christian citizen was also kind of an ideal civic citizen so the governments again had a motivation to encourage um, to encourage this religious um, kind of belief and adherence to these Christian beliefs in um, in their citizens and in their patients as well. Um, and as Christian Barico wrote very, um, put it very nicely, um, he was writing about the Italian context, but I think it really holds for the German context as well. There is a very intricate connection, he writes, between re religiosity, moral reform and social control. So, you know, taking perhaps citizens who've maybe not been the best behaved providing them with treatment, but also at the same time, religious instruction while they recover from the great pox, um, hopefully making them better, more compliant citizens um, for, for the future as well. Um, and this image um, comes from the title page of um, a tract by uh, Josef Grunpeck, who was a secretary to the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I. Um, and in this image, we nicely see um, that the baby Jesus is sending these healing rays down upon uh, praying, repenting, um, kind of religiously adhering um, pox victims. Um, while in the centre of the image we see an unrepentant victim who has not um, atoned for their sins, who has not um, tried to um, enter a dialogue perhaps with God. Um, we see that victim dying in the foreground um, and then also on the other side we see the Virgin Mary placing a crown on the head of the Emperor uh, who was Grunpeck's boss, so it was uh, somewhat in his interest to add this to have this image here as well. Um, but it also kind of shows that Maximilian will kind of lead his people in a godly direction, or that's what it, uh, what it implies as well that he's a good a good earthly ruler who follows um, the the teachings of um, the Catholic at that stage God. <clears throat> 